Ruth. And uh, Ruth is appropriate to be in, in uh, Christmas time because it's kind of what happened in Bethlehem before Jesus was around. Ruth and her family, or, or Naomi and her family is from Bethlehem. And uh, that's where the story takes place, largely. So this morning, we're going to the, the message was, is entitled, A Good Reputation Rewarded. Uh, and, and the title of the series in Ruth is called A Reversal of Fortune. It's really a, an amazing and a wonderful story of what took place during a pretty bleak time in the history of Israel. It's during the time of the judges when basically everybody was like today, doing what they wanted to do. And it was chaotic and, and uh, frankly, not much thought given uh, to the worship of the God who had brought them out of, out of Egypt. Uh, the people were wandering, going their own way, which is pretty much the story of the Old Testament and the Old Covenant and what God did to try to bring them back until finally, of course, the coming of Christ. The works thing didn't work. The trying to do good failed. The call to be rule keepers ended up becoming and making people who were simply self-righteous. That's why Jesus needed to come. So we're going to talk a little bit about a good reputation. Now, a reputation can be a fleeting thing, right? It can either be true or not true, depending on, on what's going on. You can work hard to do the right things at the right time in the right way, only to have a false rumor destroy your reputation, uh, or one bad decision destroy your reputation. Very often, however, time can give perspective, and your reputation uh, can be shed in a more positive light. Now, we've seen that a little bit in the last few days. On Friday, former President George H.W. Bush passed away. And since Friday, accolades have come in for him, uh, coming from everywhere, including those who opposed him politically, right? So they're coming in from all over the place. Now, this, of course, is what happens in the public arena, and sometimes when you hear praise for somebody who has recently died, especially coming from, from their opponents, it can sound a little bit hollow, sort of this is expected to do, so I'll say a few nice things about George H.W. Bush. But there's a sense that with him, some of this praise uh, is, is sincere because of his character. However, if this were 1992, Based on the comments coming from the press and coming from his political enemies, you would have the impression that George H.W. Bush was one of the following, or perhaps all. A liar for breaking his promise. Remember that? Read my lips. No new taxes, right? Remember that one? Only, only to be kind of compelled to raise taxes during his presidency, which, which probably cost him the election, or one of the things in 1992. You would think that he was hopelessly out of touch for what was going on in the United States economy. A very famous line by uh, James Carville, who was a Clinton strategist. You remember, it's the economy, stupid, right? The economy, stupid. Now, I'm old, so I remember all of this stuff from 1992. Or you would think he's just a highbrow from a patrician family in the, in the uh, northeast region of our country. He was linked tied to being part of the Iran-Contra affair during the Reagan administration. So all of this stuff was swarming around in 1992. You would think that he was lower than low. Now, there was not much mention of any of that on Friday or, or since then, but perhaps the most effective praise did come from former President Clinton as he shared a note written to him by Bush as Clinton began his presidency when he went into the Oval Office, there was a note from George H.W. Bush congratulating him on his victory and wishing him well in his role as president. The most effective thought probably came at the end of the note where he said this, you will be our president when you read this note. I wish you well. I wish your family well. Your success is now our country's success. I am rooting hard for you. Clinton said Bush's letter revealed the heart of who he was. He was an honorable, gracious, and decent man. Might have said some of those things in 92 during the campaign, but <laughs> didn't. But that is kind of what has come down about George Herbert Walker Bush. His reputation, as he has left this earth, has been somewhat intact as a very good man, somebody who was decent, somebody who was generous. His family, of course, were, were effusive in their praise of him. Now, 
This passage today is certainly about reputation. It's about Ruth's reputation specifically. But it's also about Boaz's graciousness propelled by his sense of faithful love for God, which determines his gracious actions toward an extended family member and her widowed daughter-in-law. Remember, one of the themes of the book of Ruth is a Hebrew word, hesed, which is loosely translated faithful love. So when you read it in the Psalms, thy loving kindness is better than life, that's the word. And it's, it's very difficult to translate into English with just one word. That's why faithful love is, is probably the best that we can do with it. But it's the kind of love that doesn't let go. It's the kind of love that remains faithful no matter what. It's the kind of love that goes the extra mile. It's the kind of love that reaches out. Frankly, it's the definition of love as it comes to us from God. Boaz includes Ruth, and, and he goes way beyond the requirements of rule-keeping in his relationship, he makes a place for her to belong, fulfilling her need, and as the story plays out, fulfilling his need for a wife, but on a larger scale, because the end of this story, the punchline to the story, is that Ruth ends up being in the line of a guy named King David. And so it fulfills the need of Israel for a righteous king. And so that's kind of what's going on behind the scenes. So the passage today, we're going to get to it in just a second, but here's what this message is about. You know what? I skipped some stuff, didn't I, David? We have some pictures. All right, I'm going to interrupt myself and go to that. So keep that thought for a moment, all right? Um, before, before I show these, uh, we have life groups at our church that meet midweek, and one of the things life groups do, other than just get together and talk about the passage of Scripture that we've gone over for this week on Sunday mornings and discuss that and the implications of it, is uh, to look around their communities for ways that we can be a blessing in God's name to our, to our community. In fact, we, we try to keep central activity to a minimum so that the life groups have time to engage the communities around them. Well, we had a chance loosely uh, in our group Tuesday night. What happened was, of course, we were going to have dinner. Leslie and I were too wiped out after Thanksgiving, having the grandson around. We, we canceled it. But we were still going to get together, and then we canceled that to go do this. And as it turned out, not many could show up, but Pat Toby did, and Leslie and I did. We, we heard of a, of a young boy named Josh Olson. Leslie and I uh, uh, volunteered at Vail Ranch, um, uh, historical. It, it's actually the Vail Ranch Restoration, if you go down... Uh, Temecula Parkway, there's uh, buildings there that were part of the original Vale Ranch, which were restored and preserved, and we're on the board for that. And there's a young boy by the name of Josh Olson who goes to one of the Temecula Elementary Schools who has leukemia, and there was a fundraiser for him Tuesday night at, uh, at Vale Ranch. So we canceled our group, we went down there and uh, to participate in this in our community. Go ahead, David, the next one. So one of the things we did, they, they do a train, and I drive the train. And uh, so there I am with my train and a little snowman in front. So through the train, just the, the tickets from the train sales, we, we made $100 for Josh that night um, for, uh, for help. So next one, David. And then there's Leslie and Pat. Leslie is working in the antique store that we're also donating proceeds that night to, uh, for Josh. Next one, David. And then there's some of the stuff that was going on for him uh, that night. So anyway, the reason I bring that up is not to pat myself on the back, although I do admit it makes us look kind of good, but, <laughs> but to, to, understand, to understand that this is really what our life groups, it's one of the things they're about, to, to be out there, to, you know, to be able to do things kind of on the spur of the moment like that that come to our attention, and that's what, that's what our group did Tuesday night. So life groups just, uh, and I know some of you others have done that, and we want to give time on Sunday morning for you to share what's happening because these are important stories in the life of our church and the life of our community. Now there's also a punchline to this one. Found out that uh, on last Tuesday night that a, uh, a guy by the name of Bob Morris had passed away. He's an old time resident of Temecula. Uh, I met his daughter. I was asked that night to participate in his memorial service which is going to be next Thursday. Uh, and that probably wouldn't have happened had I not been there. I might have, but, but that's the night all of this kind of came down. And I got to meet his daughter um, on this past Friday, who will be part of the service. You, you know this family, Marv? You're smiling. Yeah. They knew Graham. 
really well. Graham Krause, uh, Bob had worked with Graham. So, that, you know, kind of because we were around, we got a chance to participate. There's probably going to be about 400 people or so at his memorial service, a chance for the gospel. All right, so that, that's the kind of thing that we can't script this stuff, is I guess what I'm saying. We're not smart enough to plan this way, but the Holy Spirit is. And so when we make ourselves available, he makes sure that we have opportunities. He cares more about it than we do. So that, that's just by way of encouragement for all of us. All right, back to Ruth, okay? So if you get nothing else today, you can get that. Here we go. So here's what the message this morning is about. Ruth's faithful love to Naomi is rewarded by Boaz's generous treatment of her, even though she is a foreigner in Israel, a Moabite person, who the Moabites were the result of an incestuous relationship between Job and one of his daughters. They didn't have the best start in life, and they had a bad reputation in Israel. But Boaz welcomes her. He treats her as someone who belongs. Purpose of this message, to stress the importance of a good reputation, and to stress that our love for Jesus is connected to how we love and welcome one another. So that's where we're going this morning. So let me give you a review for those of you who haven't been here for the other messages. And this will be quick. A guy named Elimelech, which means God is my king, was in, lived in Bethlehem. His wife is Naomi. There was a bad drought, famine happened in, in the Bethlehem region. So he took his family, his wife Naomi, his two sons, Malon and Kilion, and they went to Moab. So again, if you're an Israelite person, Moab's not the best place to go to, but that's where they went. Not, they weren't just residents of Bethlehem. They were pretty important people in Bethlehem. So it was kind of like, you know, the Vandenbergs hit the skids, and they, and they went to Moab. While they were there, most likely only intending to stay a little while, it became their stay extended to years. Elimelech died. Living, uh, leaving Naomi as, as a widow in a foreign land. It doesn't get much worse than that. But there's still some hope. She has two sons. And they get married to Moabite women. One's name was Orpah. By the way, I think Oprah is a mispronunciation of Orpah. I, I think that's how her name came. So, and then, and then, uh, then the other was named Ruth. So they're, they're the two women who marry the sons. So think there's hope. But then hope is dashed because Malon and Kilion. But, and by the way, we don't know which son married which woman in, from, the, from the story, the narrative. It doesn't say. And then they both die. So now we don't have just one widow. We got three widows. And one of them, Naomi, the matriarch, living in a land that is not hers. And, and, and again, if you're living at that time, being a widow, especially being a widow in a foreign land, is about as hopeless as it can get. There is no, no hope for Naomi. Naomi then returns to Bethlehem. and She didn't have anything else to do. Um, the, 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 the famine had ended, so she decides, well, the best thing I can do is go home. Ruth and Orpah follow her, but she pleads with them to stay among their own people. Orpah tearfully leaves Ruth, and, and, but Ruth or tearfully leaves Naomi, but Ruth stays uttering some of the most inspirational words, words of faithfulness that are in Scripture. A lot of times these are repeated at weddings, at least they were in my day, probably not you know, your day, but my day. I think there's even some songs written with these words in it, and because and this, was, this was one daughter-in-law speaking to her mother-in-law, not a husband speaking to a wife or vice versa. She said, where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Faithful love coming from a very unexpected source if you're reading the story when it was written. And so Ruth goes with her. When they get to Bethlehem, the locals can't believe that this is Naomi. They say, is this Naomi? Her name means sweetness. And so, so Naomi tells them, call me Mara. Do not call me Naomi anymore. Mara means bitterness. I'm bitter because of what's happened to me. The hand of Yahweh, the hand of God is against me. That, that was her attitude as she went back to Bethlehem. Now it's harvest time, and Ruth, knowing that she needs to do something because Naomi is pretty much down, and she, she is not emotionally prepared to do anything to provide for them. So Ruth goes out. She has to do something. So she asks Naomi if she can go to the fields and glean. Naomi apparently had taught her that in Israel, if, you, if you're really down on your luck, you can go to the fields, you can pick up some of the grain that the harvesters leave behind. By the way, the harvesters were commanded by God to leave some behind. 
for those who were, who, who were poor, and you can go glean. So there was nothing else to do, so Ruth goes and does that. She just happens, according to the text, with very much tongue-in-cheek, because God is behind everything that's going on here, just happens to go to a field which is owned by a guy named Boaz, who happens to be a kinsman of Elimelech, the deceased husband of Naomi. Now, if you're a good Israelite, you know, oh, there's hope now, because we got a family member involved in this. And, and Ruth just happened to go to his field, among all the fields she, she could have gone to. So Boaz, last week Charles brought the message, he told you, uh, Boaz has uh, kind of noticed her, and he has told who she is and how hard she's been working, gleaning that day. All right, so that's where we pick it up. All right, first point today is this. Faithful love exceeds rule-keeping. Faithful love exceeds rule-keeping. Here's the text, Ruth chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Now, if you are an Israelite reading this when it was written, you are shocked. This just this kind of graciousness just doesn't happen. Gleaning was allowed, as I've already told you, in fact, commanded in Israel. Look, if you're harvesting, leave, leave the corners of your fields unharvested and allow those who are poor to come and, and glean. What is the grain that are, that's left behind? Even though it was commanded, it wasn't always honored. You imagine you're, you know, you're a farm owner, you're a field owner. The gleaners, probably you considered them, look, if you people really work, you wouldn't be down on your, you know, you know how the attitude goes, right? You're down on your luck through your own fault. Don't take my field. Don't take my grain. So that, it wasn't always honored. It was, and, and if it was honored, very often honored only grudgingly. And we know that during the time of the judges, God was being widely ignored. So his commands were not widely circulating and everybody joyfully doing what God wanted them to do. It was a time where people were just doing what they wanted to do. So if you were a farmer or a field owner, likely, you know, you didn't really like this law, so you might have hindered people from doing it. It is unprecedented of an owner unprecedented for an owner to go directly to the people gleaning. Why in the world would the owner do this? And singles one out, Ruth, and tells her, don't go to another field. Very often it would be, go down the road. They got more grain than I do. All right? Look, just leave. Invites her to stay, but that's what... Bo so he went beyond the law by singling Ruth out and inviting her to stay. The women that he told Ruth to, to kind of stay behind were the ones who were gathering up the, the grain that the men had cut and kind of putting them into bundles. And so when he said, stay with them, stay close to them, that means that she would look much more, or she would look much less like a gleaner and much more like a harvester. In other words, you belong. Further, he assures Ruth that she will not be harassed by the young men. He says, I told them not to touch you. Now, this to us would probably have some sexual connotations. Like, okay, hey, I'll meet you afterward, and, and, and sexual assault. But that's really probably not what's going on here. It would, it would be, don't forcibly remove her. Don't treat her roughly like that. Because very often that's what they did. They would forcibly remove the gleaners. Get out. You, you have enough. Go. But there's even more. When we move on to verse 14, it says this. And at mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here and eat some bread and dip your morsel in the wine. You've hated Italian restaurants before. You take a piece of bread, drip it, and it tastes pretty good, right? So that's kind of what's going on here. So she sat beside the reapers, and he passed to her roasted grain, and she ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. 
When she rose to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and do not reproach her. And also pull out some of the bundles for her, and leave it for her to glean, and do not rebuke her. Now earlier he had said, you can drink our water too. And now he is inviting her to lunch. Have, work, have lunch with us and with the workers. And he gave her more food than, than she needed. Now I don't know about you, but when I hear and there was some left over, my mind immediately goes to Jesus and the feeding of the 5,000. Tells the disciples, look, gather up the extras. There's leftovers. So he is not only meeting Ruth's need, he's, he's meeting her need to excess. He's going much further than the extra mile. Then he gives his workers another very clear instruction to, let her, to, to leave her alone. And he says, now you can get in among the sheaves, not just on the outskirts, not just with the women, but kind of eat, you know. They, and then he gave her more. He, he tells them, look, let her, don't rebuke her. Let, her, let her do this. Now, Ruth was shocked, as you might imagine, shocked by this. She's a Moabitess. She understands what Jews think of Moabite people. By the way, we saw a really good movie on Friday night called The Green Book. I highly recommend it. It's really, it, it's about, The Green Book was a book that was published by African Americans to help other African Americans in Jim Crow era South where to go. Obviously, they weren't welcome everywhere, and so they had the Green Book, which told them where to go. The movie is really more about the relationship between a highly educated black musician and a New York Italian guy with no education whatsoever. It, the, the, the interplay between these guys is really fascinating. If you get a chance, go see it. But uh, my mind was brought to that movie as I finished up preparing this week. It, Boaz treated her like she belonged. And the treatment that this musician was getting in the South, of course, was anything else. You can entertain us, but you, you can't eat with us. You can't even use our bathrooms. It, it's, a, it, it, it's really a great movie about that relationship. So that's what Boaz is doing. And so Ruth is shocked. And in verse 13, she says this, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, though I am not even one of your servants. She, she's amazed at his generosity and his graciousness, and, and she had perhaps, now imagine this, she is a widow, a young widow, coming from Moab, and if anybody paid attention to her at all, especially a man, it was probably sexual attention, and here she's getting, she's getting treatment like she's a queen. I, I'm sure this is the first time she encountered this kind of, this kind of graciousness, this kind of Belonging. Now you go back to verse 10. Then she fell on her face, bowing to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? I'm a Moabite person. I understand how the Moabites got started. It's pretty disgusting. Lot's daughters, after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, got their dad drunk. Both of them had sex with him. Moab was one. And that's how the Moabites said. She understood that. She understood what Israelites thought about her. Now the Hebrew in this verse is very clever, as Hebrew often can be. Literally the phrase, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? The phrase literally reads that you should recognize the unrecognized. Why is it that you recognize the unrecognized? I, I should be a nothing, and you're less than nothing in your eyes, but you've recognized me. Boaz is acting in the same kind of loving kindness that God has shown for his people. This, this concept of his said that the loving kindness, the faithful love of God, Boaz is demonstrating what it looks like. The kind of faithful love that goes beyond just doing what is expected. Now, again, if you're like me, my mind immediately goes to Jesus as he's talking to the Pharisees in one instance. And if you go to Matthew uh, chapter 23, it's not on your notes or anywhere. Matthew 23 is Jesus just giving a withering denunciation of the Pharisees. And, and, and in that, I mean, it's, it's, he's not being nice to them. He's not being meek and mild to them. He, he's, he's pretty much in their face. 
Here's one of the things he says. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. The kind of love that is inspired by God, the kind of love inspired by Jesus and the Holy Spirit, always goes the extra mile on behalf of another. It's not necessarily just concerned with keeping the laws that exist, but going beyond what the law requires. Going beyond simple rule keeping, going beyond religion, going beyond the external stuff into the stuff that really matters. The reason, now this is key, the reason why religion or simple rule keeping is inadequate is because of what it causes and because of what it can't do. Simple religion and rule keeping almost always brings about a self-imposed spiritual blindness, leading us to believe we're better than others somehow because we keep the rules better. It, it is, and, and it's what Jesus denounced. Simple religion and rule keeping brings about a self-imposed spiritual blindness. If that's all we're concerned with, keeping rules, it's stuff we check off. Now, therefore, God has got to do some nice things for me because I've done this stuff for him. It, it's a deal-making, sort of, with God. And unfortunately, that's not how it works. We, we can't do enough, according to Scripture. And, and, and the second reason that rule-keeping is useless is because it can't win anyone's heart. When you're self-righteous, saying I'm better than you, you're not really not winning the hearts and minds of anyone, are you? Even your children. When, when all we're concerned with is keeping rules, then that's all we get. Jesus says, you Pharisees, you like to pray in the street corner, and I tell you, you have your reward. You're looking for the praise of men, and that's what you get, I guess, but you're, you're getting nothing from my Father in heaven. He's not impressed with that sort of, he's not impressed with religion, not impressed with just simple rule keeping, because it falls short. As opposed to that, Paul writes in Romans 5, 8, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There was, there was no compelling reason in terms of our behavior that Jesus died for us. He just simply understood we needed him to. We, we were hopeless in terms of coming up to God's standard. When I, when I talk to people about sin, and especially people that get turned off by Christians talking about sin, and, 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 you know, and I'm told, what, well, what about good people? Here, here's my response, and I, I don't know about you, but let's just say God made no commands whatsoever. No Ten Commandments, nothing else. How successful have you been in your life at keeping your own commands? You know, I, New, Year's, New Year's is coming up. You might make a resolution. How long does it, what, what's, what's your record for keeping a New Year's resolution? You know, maybe a year, two years? The problem with this is that we are hopelessly bent. We do have a problem, and we all know it. We know that we can't even keep our own. There's a moral standard, according to Scripture, that God has given us in our hearts, and we can't keep, even our own, we can't keep, much less his. Paul makes it really clear in Romans that all the law could do was kill me. The law set the standard, I fell short, therefore I'm dead. And that was all it could do. Now, it was effective in doing it, it was really good <laughs> at showing me that, but it could not save me. Law keeping, rule keeping, can't, it, I get spiritually blind and I'm not winning anybody's hearts and mind, instead I'm self-righteous. Boaz is a truly righteous man, not because he keeps the law, but because he goes beyond the law. He is compelled by the faithful love of God to see the plight of Ruth and Naomi, and despite the bad reputations of Moabites, he welcomes Ruth into the fellowship of the people of God. It is a tremendous picture of what eventually would happen when Christ forgave us of our sin. Now, the second point is this. Our actions determine our reputations, or I could say our actions determine our character. Reputations can kind of come and go. But here's what happened. In the passage, 
Ruth 2, verses 11 and 12. So Ruth had just asked, why have I found favor? Right? What, what's going on here? Here's what Boaz said. Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told me. And how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. The Lord repay you for what you have done and a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Man, what a beautiful statement. Part of Boaz's faithful love was inspired by Ruth's faithful love to her mother-in-law. She stayed with Naomi when she could have left. She chose to leave everything comfortable and familiar in her life to stay with her mother-in-law. She gave up the hope of marriage in her home country for the seeming hopelessness of going to a foreign land where she knew she wasn't going to be liked, probably not welcome, in order to take care of Naomi. I mean, she basically kissed her future goodbye when she stayed with Naomi and went, went into Bethlehem in terms of human reasoning. She did it not because of the, she did it in spite of all of her prospects there. She was not heading, as far as she knew, to a better place and a better future. She was leaving it behind. Boaz recognized this in Ruth, which is a beautiful picture of Boaz. It, it's kind of like the Good Samaritan, right? Jesus said, who's, you know, uh, the, 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 love your neighbor. And they said, well, who's my neighbor? And so Jesus told the story of the Good Samaritan. You know, the guy got beat up, a rabbi, some other religious types passed by. And then a dirty, no good, rotten, scoundrel, pork-eating Samaritan. stopped and helped the guy. And Jesus, who was this man's neighbor, the man who showed compassion. Go and do the same. That's what's going on here, and Boaz recognized that in Ruth. Somebody who should not have been expected to behave this way or to act this way is the person who did. And so Boaz, in a sense, was was inspired not just for the loving kindness of God, but also for Ruth because of Ruth's behavior. And then he blesses Ruth. He says this, Yahweh, or the Lord, repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given to you by Yahweh, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Now, in essence, Boaz is saying, and this is incredible, God owes you. May the Lord repay you. That's what it means. May the Lord repay you. In a sense, what he's, what he's saying is this. Look, you know what, Ruth? Your behavior deserves the blessing of God. And may Yahweh... And again, in Old Testament reckoning, this was very much the thought. But it demonstrates a character that is inspired by God. And when we get to New Testament times, we find out this is just how people who know their God act. And frankly, in the Old Testament, it was the same way. This is how people who know their God, who have been empowered by God, this is how they act. And Ruth was displaying that. And so Boaz, blessing, and he wishes for her Yahweh's blessing in a time when Yahweh was being largely ignored. The covenant God of Israel, largely ignored by his people. And here was a Moabitess doing all the stuff that, frankly, the Israelites should have been doing and, and demonstrating attitudes and actions that, frankly, the people of God should have been demonstrating, doing all of that. Now, the original readers of this story would be asking, well, will Boaz step in? Will Boaz step in? And Charles talked about romance last week, and it was, that's bubbling under the surface here. Will Boaz do what a kinsman was supposed to do in this culture, which is redeem Ruth? and Naomi, redeem their fortunes. As it turns out, he becomes the answer to his own prayer. Have you ever had that happen to you? Lord, I really wish you would <laughs> fill in the blank. And then as soon as you pray that, 
God starts working on you and saying, hey, what about you? <laughs> How are you going to step in to this? Boy, it's very often that, that God will do that. Put something, most men, in fact, I would say, uh, I don't know, I don't have any, any uh, um, you know, evidence that's been researched to base this on, but my guess would be 99.9% .9 of all ministries start because somebody gets a little bit discontented with something. And they begin praying, and God says to them, hey, what about you? Why don't you start this thing? And then and you do. And thus becoming part of the answer to the prayer that you'd made to God. It's amazing. First he puts it on your heart to pray for it, then he puts it on your heart to go do something about it. That's why it usually doesn't help to go ask somebody else to do something that God put on your heart. Because God's probably saying something different to them. So if you get a burden like this, it's probably God saying to you, look, engage it. Engage it. See where I take you. Okay, you hear about a need with a little boy in elementary school needs a, a bone marrow transplant and some money to pay for it. Well, go. Do something about it. Some other groups is in the same. You heard a great story from Kevin Grube again a few weeks ago about just the grocery store encounter and how, how somebody who was embittered towards God got ministered to by somebody who knew God, to her great surprise. It's amazing. Ruth's actions led to her reputation as a faithful daughter-in-law to Boaz, and Boaz welcomes her, or a, a, a faithful daughter-in-law to Naomi, and Boaz welcomes her because of it. His faithful love for God plays out in his relationships with other people. So let's wrap this up now. Exactly exactly how John, the disciple of Jesus, described it and who said, this is how it's supposed to work. Not in your notes or anything, but if you have a Bible, turn to 1 John 4, verses 7 through 11. John, the beloved disciple, the one who knew Jesus loved him, which is pretty, it, it's a great way that John describes himself in the gospel. Writing about love and love for God, writes this, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest, or in other words, shown among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us, and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. The message of John and the other gospel writers and the New Testament writers, including Paul, especially Paul, is this. Love of God is always connected to how we love one another. It is always connected to how we love... It, sure, you can go do your silent retreats and really get your relationship with God in, in place, correct? You can tell God you love him and you can, you can express your love for God and worship and sing and praise to him, but what the New Testament writers like John are saying is that if that somehow doesn't translate to how you treat others, especially in the body of Christ, you may as well drop the facade because that's what it is. It's a facade. It, it looks good. You look spiritual. You look like a good rule keeper. But if it is not, if it is not impacting how we treat one another, it's not from God. Our, our love for him and sin and what John is saying is useless and it's not true. Because it will always be connected to how we treat other people. Now again, in the body of Christ, one of the things, as, as we love one another, if Paul were to say it, he, in fact, he did say it like this. One of the ways we show our love for one another is to speak truth in love. Mirroring the grace and the truth of Jesus himself. Remember how John described Jesus in John chapter 1? And the word became flesh. In other words, God loved us and did something about it. He inconvenienced himself to the extreme. The word became flesh, lived among us, dwelt with us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of 
grace and truth. The way we love one another always comes out, always is translated through this filter of graciously truth-talking to one another. Now, let me be really practical for a moment because this comes up almost all the time in the body of Christ. It's one thing that, you know, to say, being able to graciously deliver truth to someone in the body of Christ, I think, is, is kind of the litmus test of how well we're doing with this. Are you able? Am I able? To approach a brother or sister in Christ and deliver information or a message that I really don't want to deliver because I know it might be offensive, but must be delivered. But to do it in a way that is loving. <clears throat> you ever, ever been there? That, according to Paul, is kind of the height. This is how Christian love really demonstrates and manifests itself is our ability not just to do emotional things and nice, fuzzy, warm things for one another. That's in play all the time, of course. Hugging, you know, all of that stuff is always in play, demonstrating our love in that way. But speaking truthfully in love to one another, not speaking truthfully critically to one another, not denouncing people by using the truth, the truth, the Word of God can be a great weapon if you want to use it as such. The ultimate clout, right? But always making sure, as we talk to others truthfully, that we're paying attention to the log in our own eye before we start trying to pick out specks in other people's eye. It demands that we truth tell, but graciously. That is one of the ways, one of the best ways, that we can show one another that we love one another. Of course, include one another. Of course, of course make sure that we're doing doing some of the external things that let, that let people know that we do love them, we, we want to include them, but boy, when it comes down, when it boils down to relationships, being able to truth tell graciously. Don't forget that as we talk about love. As the band comes up, here's the next step. Here's, here's what I challenge you to do and what I challenge myself to do this week. And over the next month, practice faithful love to a neighbor and by neighbor, I mean somebody who lives in your proximity. Whether you're, you know, you're in a house or apartment. Or what. Practice faithful love to a neighbor by going beyond what is expected of you. Show the love of Christ by, abiding, by inviting a neighbor, and this is just a suggestion, to a meal. And including that neighbor in your circle of friends. Now, if you're in a life group or something like that, and you know, you know we got a few neighbors in our block right now in need. We have a, a woman who's going through cancer treatment. She lives right next door. She's a little bit reclusive. We have another woman who lives down the street. I've already told you about me. You know, I'm mowing her yard for her. But Bring them, if, if you sense the Holy Spirit, bring them into your circle of relationships. Bring them into your circle, your group. Nothing speaks you belong more than inviting people into the circle of relationships that you have. Especially somebody who is in need, somebody who maybe God is putting on your heart right now saying, go talk to this person, invite, invite. They might say, no, I don't know what they're going to do. But I just challenge us to do this. This is truly how, how people experience the body of Christ who don't know about the body of Christ yet. They'll be brought in not because of how good our theology is, although it should be good, they will be brought in not because of our bumper stickers. They will be brought in because they will see that they're loved, and then when they are among us, according to Jesus, they will see how we love one another. And it will blow their minds because they've never experienced anything like this before in their lives. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your faithful love to us. Thank you that it never ends. Thank you that you did for us what we did not deserve by coming to this earth, taking on a body which was a vast limitation for you, and then giving that body to die for us as we have just celebrated and remember what you did for us today at communion. And as we think about you coming to earth during this time of year, and we think about the circumstances of your coming to earth, we thank you 
that when you did come to earth, you came in a way you did not deserve. You came in humbleness when you deserved greatness. You came unnoticed when you deserved to be noticed by everyone. You came fragile, thus approachable. You came to the least, not the high and mighty. And so, Lord, as we think about all of that, may we serve you, but may we serve you in the way that those who know you serve. Thank you for this message today from Ruth. Thank you, Lord, that we can do these things and, and even have a good reputation while we do them by the way we love one another. And we pray these things. As